Without uh, further ado, uh, I will uh, introduce the first uh, debate on uh, technology, who is in the driver's seat. Uh, in order to do this, we'll have a first introduction uh, by uh, Jacques Biot, board member and advisors to companies in the field of digital transformation and artificial intelligence, uh, also well known as former president of the Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. So uh, this will be followed by a uh, complimentary view of Alexandra Prieux. Uh, she is uh, president of Alcediag. This is a subsidiary of Alzen uh, Diversified Technology Group focused on innovation. And she has also launched a company called uh, sorry about that, uh, Skillset. Uh, so these will be the two introductions. So, uh, Jacques, over to you. Thank you, uh, Patrick. And uh, so, yeah, the question is, um, where is the invisible hand in the uh, healthcare market? And uh, we're going to see that actually uh, there is no invisible hand, in my view, and uh, we definitely would need one. And uh, we would need one which would be at the end of a long arm, which would have a strategic view. So basically, my, my paper will be about managing healthcare, the need for and the difficulty of a strategic approach. So um, if we just look at the situation, do healthcare systems work well? Uh, my answer, although the French are very proud about their own French, uh, their uh, own uh, health, healthcare system, is in general, healthcare systems don't work well. There are many inefficiencies. Uh, costs are growing, burgeoning. And at the same time, a number of indicators, and, and we'll see that one of the difficulties is about finding good indicators of, uh, of health. Uh, indicators are not necessarily going in the right direction. And so the question is, why is that? And, and my point is that we're going to explore the interests of the various players, and we'll see that the interests of various players are extremely different uh, and, and there is nobody in the driver's seat, as uh, Thierry said, to really steer the issue. And, and one of the issues we'll see is that if you want to steer an organization or to steer a system, you need to have metrics. And we'll see that one of the big issues is that there are no recognized metrics or not enough recognized metrics in uh, healthcare. So basically, where do we start from? Well, strangely enough, you know, I've been working for 30 years about in, uh, in the healthcare uh, industry. And what strikes me, if you compare it to other high technology intensive industries like air, you know, the aerospace industry or the uh, uh, telecom industry, um, healthcare is extremely fragmented still. It's extremely fragmented, especially when it comes to the provision of healthcare and to the, the supply of healthcare goods. If you look at basically the major players, uh, the major health provider in the, in the US uh, would really earn only a very little market share of, of, the, uh, of hospitals. Uh, of, of, uh, you know, they operate less than 200 hospitals among 5,500 facilities which are active in the US. Uh, the top US providers are responsible for only 18% of all inpatient days. And that's something which basically is in place in almost all, all countries. If you look at the industry of healthcare goods, drugs or, uh, or medical device, uh, the current leader in, in pharma, which is in pure pharma, which is Pfizer, earns about 5% of the market. Uh, if you look at the medical technology industry, uh, the uh, top 10 earn less than 40% of the market. So very fragmented. And so, and the question is why didn't a consolidation happen like what happened in, for instance, the aerospace industry or in telecom? And, and we're going to see that to some extent, the market didn't play this role. And we know that the market doesn't play this role in healthcare because actually there is no consumer. There are several, players, uh, there is the patient uh, whom I will keep for the end to talk about because he's not really somebody who has a say on what happens to him until now. 
and there are prescribers and there are providers, uh, not always the same, and then there are the uh, payers or uh, insurers, and, and this really splitting of the various functions of uh, consumerism are uh, the, the real cause for the lack of a strategy. Now, as mentioned, the issue is, first of all, how do we measure health? Uh, WHO has a very demanding definition of health, which is the fact that health is a state of well-being disregarding any question of uh, illness or disability or whatever. So, it's all, I mean, health, according to the WHO definition, is almost unachievable. Now, once you get one step deeper, you suddenly discover that still for WHO and for the medical community in the world, uh, there are today 55,000 of pathological situations. And actually, there is no ranking be 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 between these uh, pathological situations. So 55,000 illnesses. And that's uh, according to the ICD, which is now going to become the ICD-11, 11th uh, version, which will be rolled out in, in, in January 2022. And to address those 55,000 different diseases, what do we have? We have basically innovation, which is very bottom-up and which is not driven by any I would say upper force, and those um, those trials. I mean, there are about three hundred fifty thousand clinical trials going on at any time, and of which forty six thousand are published currently, and uh, which all stem from initiatives which are basically initiatives from uh, from the industry, and so you are left with a situation where you have governments or payers who have a hand on the budget, who have very little lever on uh, how to orientate those expenses. Basically, if you're a government, what happens? You have a budget that you have to, to levy from uh, taxpayers or from insured people, and you have to allocate it to various silos, some of which are not flexible at all. Basically, healthcare provision, you know, hospitals are very heavy, I would say, ships uh, with uh, in heavy investment and uh, staff. So you can't change the, basically, at a very fast pace, the way in which you fund and operate uh, hospitals. And so the only I would say leverage that you have short term if you want to curb expenses is to cut expenses on healthcare goods. And so that's basically what governments do. And without really trying to set priorities, if you look at the priorities currently, I mean, WHO priorities are not disease based, they are about health for all or health for women, adolescents, and, and children or uh, uh, healthcare in, in, at the time of, of uh, climate change. So they are very broad and very transverse, but, but they don't provide a clue to industry players as to where do we want to orientate our research. And if you look at governments, it's pretty much the same. So if you're a government, you're left with your larger or smaller bulk, bulk of money, but you have little opportunity to allocate it in a different way. And the only way to do this is to cut expenses on, on healthcare goods. Now, if you are a, a hospital, what can you do? I mean, you earn, again, a very expensive facility. You are chasing for market share locally. You chase for uh, recruiting or in competition to recruit good physicians, which are really the people who are going to attract patients to your place you are potentially chasing for nurses because that's a resource which often is in uh, is uh, lacking. And you're not going to have much strategic leeway uh, if you want to develop a specific pathology. This may take time. And if you look at the profitability of healthcare provision, you'll realize that this is the lowest profitability in all the system. 
it's basically depending on places in the range of just a few percent, uh, a few percentage points, and uh, very often decreasing. It's decreasing, for instance, in the US. And you, the only exceptions are people who have focused on some specific uh, uh, diseases and, and who address specific pathologies and try to build differentiation because they, they address a specific pathology. But basically, a very unprofitable, unproductive business. Uh, McKinsey showed that over the last, I think, uh, 10 years, basically, the contribution of healthcare to the GDP was much less than it should have been if you compare it to the increase in jobs. So healthcare created some growth, but basically it uh, hired many more people and it, it lost productivity. So a very unproductive world in, in healthcare provision. If you are head of strategy at a pharma or at medical technology company, what do you do? I mean, you don't, you don't have any clue from, uh, from governments as to where they would like you to develop things. We have a clue currently on vaccines because that's kind of, a, I would say, anecdotal. It's, it's something that doesn't happen all the time. But in the, in the stable state, there is not much orientation from governments. There are a few exceptions. There is the vaccination quest by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. There are cancer plans in many countries but not very indication. So you are left with trying to find out um, from the epidemiology, how many patients are going to appear in a given pathology to estimate which price you will be able to, uh, at which price you will be able to um, sell a potential uh, solution. And, and then you are going to direct your strategy. And what has changed a lot in the world of, of the pharma industry is the fact that after outsourcing most of the development to large contract uh, clinical research organizations, so-called CROs, now the pharma industry relies mostly on startups also to provide even the new molecular entities or the biologicals. So even the science has been outsourced, and which means that the pharma industry, which traditionally enjoys, with the exception of generic companies, uh, traditionally enjoys high profitability, uh, the pharma industry has shifted the risk to venture capitalists. And but so they have also shifted part of the profitability towards venture capitalists. And then we see a decrease in the profitability of, of pharma. Now the last, so that's basically the situation. What are the solutions? Well, the, the solutions uh, from my perspective, first of all, would be to agree on metrics. Because if you look at health in general, there are not many elements to measure health in a country. Or there are many indicators, but you know, uh, there is of course life expectancy. And then you're going to kind of mitigate this with disability. So you reckon in terms of disability adjusted life years, uh, you may use what is called quality adjusted life years. But in the end, nobody has a clue as to whether governments should prioritize the treatment of disease A or of disease B or of, of a solution which is provided in a disease rather than another one. And so the issue of the metrics and, and, and the metrics issue, I, I don't have time to go into the issue of the metrics in clinical trials, but the issue of the metrics is extremely difficult. If you realize, if you remember that you have like 350,000 clinical trials going on, this means that you're going to have outcomes which are going to be very detailed on different endpoints which have been defined this per disease and agreed upon by clinicians, but you have no clue of what should I prioritize. And, and this is one of the big issues of the system. And this is why the whole system is, is going to a situation where, of course, the economy would not be sustainable. There are 6,000 about rare diseases with high expectations from patients and patients are organized in groups and so when a company develops a treatment for a rare disease, patients will go to the governments and they will ask the, uh, the treatment to be reimbursed. Now, 
most of those treatments may cost several hundreds of thousands of dollars per, uh, per patient. And with a rare population of 100 patients, you end up very quickly with a few hundreds of millions of dollars for a rare disease times 6,000, you realize that there will be no way to address the expectations of patients. So my point, and, and I'd like to finish uh, here and to leave room for the discussion. And uh, of course, uh, I think we can provide a lot more data to, to this discussion. My point is what should be done? First of all, invest in research in epidemiology and health economics because this is something that not many people understand, uh, whether in the population, in the press, in governments, in administrations. So this is a very rare, I would say, club of people who understand amongst themselves, but, but this is very difficult to translate. And so the idea is first, let's develop the research in epidemiology and uh, in health economics. And then, it would make sense to create some kind of a, a multilateral discussion, like has been suggested by Thierry this morning, to really see how we can prioritize efforts in research and development. And while, of course, keeping this uh, serendipity-based serendipity research, which provides solutions to uh, current who's, but really, decide where governments should input resources instead of being always kind of uh, uh, forced to consider solutions that they did not necessarily have the initiative of, uh, of launching. So with this, I would like to thank you and, uh, and I will be happy to uh, answer questions later. Thank you, Jack, uh, for this uh, overview of the uh, economics of the healthcare uh, activities. So